Einen schönen guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Mein Name ist Bernhard Kittel, ich bin Professor für Wirtschaftssoziologie an der Universität Wien und ich werde Sie durch den Abend äh, leiten. Since our guest is English speaking, uh, we shift to English now. Um, this event is a joint cooperation between the University of Vienna, the uh, University of Economics and Business Vienna, the Central European University in Vienna, as well as the Chamber of Labor and the City of Vienna, represented by uh, the Volkshochschule, uh, who is also hosting us. Um, the Vienna Karl Polanyi Visiting Professorship has been installed uh, a few years ago. And we have made a tradition of having the public lecture uh, with the Volkshochschule. And I'm very glad that you are hosting us now. Um, the basic idea underlying Karl Polanyi's great transformation is the existence of a double movement. On the one hand, the utopian drive of market ideologists fosters the disembedding of the economy from the society and the subjugation of human beings under market forces. On the other hand, citizens take action in various forms to resist this drive and to contain the disruptive consequences of the political construction of markets, notably for fictitious goods such as land, labor, and money. This antagonism accompanies the history of capitalism as a continuous tug of war between the two movements with alternating fate. So a question that imposes itself when reflecting on the double movement is whether there's any chance to reconcile that perennial back and forth and to establish a more stable societal order that allows citizens to live in freedom, peace, and prosperity. Without explicitly referring to Karl Polanyi, Lane Kenworthy has addressed this question in an early book entitled Egalitarian Capitalism, published in 2004 at Oxford University Press. In this book, which I had the pleasure to discuss with him when he wrote parts of it, when we both have been at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies more than 20 years ago, um, he explored the trade-offs between equality and economic growth, jobs and incomes. He su suggested that a successful strategy for striking a balance between the counteracting forces might be to center on employment-friendly egalitarianism and equality of opportunity. Throughout his further academic career, he has continued to explore the conditions for just societies with a growing emphasis on the American experience. Since 2014, Lane Kenworthy is Professor of Sociology and Political Science and Yankelovich Chair in Social Thought at the University of California in San Diego. As a sociologist and political scientist, he's examining the economic effects of income and wealth distribution and works on welfare state, transformation toward increased societal and economic security and equal opportunity. He has also gradually moved toward a greater interest in public affairs and has engaged in political debates. In his recent publication, The Good Society, Lane Kenworthy discusses what we want in a good society across various topics from community, democracy, economic equality, opportunity, prosperity, family, finance, health, inclusion to safety and privacy, as well as the question, how to get good society outcomes. He publishes the chapters on his homepage as he writes them, and you can thus follow the making of the book. Today, he will speak about a specific aspect of the good society, the good city. However, before asking Lane to share his thoughts with us, I would like to ask our Vice Dean, Third Mission and International Affairs, Jan Fabian Emke, to officially grant the Vienna Karl Polanyi Guest Professorship to him. So please.
So, Lane, it's a pleasure to have you here. The floor is yours. Sorry, I think you have to wait for Lane a little bit longer. <laughs> uh, good evening. Um, dear Professor Kenworthy, dear guests, dear co-hosts and co-organizers, dear colleagues at the VHS and Event Center Urania, my name is Jamie Wojtynek, and in the name of the Wiener Volkshochschulen and as a member of the team Innovation and International Affairs, of the Wiener Volkshochschule itself. I have the special honor to welcome you to tonight's public lecture on the recent publication, The Good Society by Professor Lane Kenworthy. I'm very much looking forward to your lecture, Professor Kenworthy, and I'm excited to get to know some of your thoughts, suggestions, and perhaps some of the hurdles or difficulties concerning the good city and the good society. The good life for everyone, on the other hand, is something that comes across my paths of thinking on quite a regular and probably daily basis. It is indeed not surprising that it does concerning my personal and professional commitment to adult and political education, but also to my notions of agency and transformation. The demand of a good life for everyone clearly is a result of the perceivable problems of the many. We need to discuss our visions and ideas for a more equal and better future more often and actively with each other. We have to move beyond our own frames of thinking and remain open to new perspectives to tackle the societal issues of our times collectively. We have to dismantle injustices and earn the title of a good society every day and together, specifically in cross-institutional ways. It is a cross-institutional cooperation itself which made it possible to host Professor Lane Kenworthy tonight and which organized the basics for this promising lecture and also supports his following guest professorship in Vienna. I am therefore very honored to also thank and welcome the representatives and colleagues in this alliance, the University of Vienna, the Vienna University of Economics and Business, the Central European University and of course the International Karl Polanyi Society. The Wiener Volkshochschulen are very grateful to be part of this cross-institutional collaboration as it enables us to follow our long traditions of science communication through public access to lectures and extraordinary formats of science and political education. These traditions are stabilizing and strengthening our education, uh, our democratic stance and work, and they lead our vision of a society and city which ensures education for everybody, which ensures the good for everyone, a society and city that fights pressing inequalities and injustices as it recognizes them. I think we still have a lot of work to do, yet we are finding interesting points of departure every time we put effort and work into events like this. I want to again thank you all for being here and making this important collaboration possible. At last, I have the honor to welcome Lane Kenworthy on stage now, who is going to give us um, the speech of this evening. So welcome, Lane Kenworthy, and thank you all for your attention and interest. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, to everyone involved, uh, including the, the two presenters who gave such a nice introduction. Uh, I'm very pleased and honored to be here. Uh, uh, it's extremely flattering uh, to be mentioned in the same breath as Karl Polanyi and his work. I've been a fan of it for a long time. And in some respects, all of my academic career has been mainly trying to figure out the implications of uh, what he uh, expressed so clearly as, as Bernard uh, mentioned before about this tension between uh, how to let markets do what they do well, uh, and they do do some things very well, and how to make sure that uh, we as individuals and as a society are nevertheless cushioned, protected against the, the worst parts of this. Uh, and in some ways, that's exactly what uh, my big project, The Good Society, is all about. Um, this is one component of it. I have a co-author, very important to acknowledge that, Joel Rogers. Uh, probably knows much more about cities and urban policy than, uh, than I do, maybe than I'll ever know. And he's been a very important part of this uh, project. So this is, this is very much joint work. Okay, let me start right in. Um, my, my big picture attempt, uh, effort here, 
is to try to understand the institutions and policies that are conducive to human flourishing. That's the core of what I think a good society uh, involves. And I'm, I'm pretty convinced that these elements here are important. Uh, I draw on the work of others in identifying affluence is key. There's a chapter on the Good Society page, uh, on my webpage that Bernard uh, nicely mentioned here. So you can read about the evidence but that I'm simply summarizing and trying to, to put together. A peaceful international order, uh, we're reminded of pretty regularly that this is a precondition for uh, having a good life and, and uh, allowing the institutions and policies that we construct in order to make our society better to actually do what we intend them to do. The third thing here I spent more time on than anything else. Uh, this is essentially trying to understand the core components of what many people would call the Nordic model. I call social democratic capitalism. You could just as easily call it Polanyian capitalism. Uh, I think for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to talk about here, although I'd be happy to if you're really interested, uh, that this set of institutions and policies uh, yields the best outcomes uh, of any that, that humans have uh, been able to construct. And that this has been true for roughly 30 or 40 years. It's not perfect. There's no guarantee it'll continue to work uh, going forward. Um, but it looks from the evidence that we have that it's really, really good. Um, the, the last one is what I'm going to talk about tonight, which is good cities. Uh, and this is a departure for me. It's new. Um, but I want to tell you the, the story and, uh, and see what you think. Very much looking forward to any suggestions or criticisms or comments or additions or what, whatever you might have to, to offer, either tonight or later on uh, uh, in private or over email or whatever way you want to uh, convey your thoughts and, and uh, join the discussion. So um, here's the, an, an overview of what we're saying here. People like cities. This wasn't always the case. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, in fact, it, it's relatively recent that, uh, that this is true. There are benefits to population density. That is, cities can do some good things. Uh, economic productivity, economies of scale in providing public goods and services. They seem to be better at health. This is counterintuitive, coming off the heels of the pandemic, but I'll explain why. Uh, greater tolerance, better quality of life, and better for environmental sustainability. Some of these effects are pretty strong. Some, we're not sure exactly how strong they are, but they're all advantages to cities broadly construed. And by the way, there are different ways to define cities or urban areas, and I'm not going to get into the weeds uh, about exactly what definition is best. I'm fairly convinced now that it, this doesn't matter a whole lot. So the OECD has a definition, the IMF has a definition, the United Nations has a definition, different individual social scientists have other definitions, and national governments often have their own idiosyncratic definition. So I'm going to set that entirely to the side and, and not worry about it, uh, partly because it complicates matters, but also partly because, as I just said, I really don't think it makes much difference to the, the points that we're making here. Okay, so people like cities, there are benefits to, to density. Uh, that is to say, cities can do some good. And, uh, and this is what I'll perhaps spend the most time on, there are uh, feasible, affordable policies, most of which are in use right now in particular cities and particular countries that could make things better. So they're already good. People seem to like them. Uh, there are ways we could make them better. And this is based on evidence rather than speculation or, uh, or hypothesis for the most part. So that's the, the gist of, of what I'm going to say. Uh, and I, I, I already just mentioned this. Uh, really important caveat, which is that although we're speaking about cities globally, the evidence that we have comes mainly from the experience of rich democratic countries, like my country, the United States, Austria, and uh, a variety of others. Uh, and so the degree to which we can be confident that the kinds of policies and institutions we're recommending would actually work in middle-income countries and poor countries, not so great. I'm optimistic, but that's um, more just my nature than, uh, than really, really evidence-based at this moment. Okay, so let me start with the second of the three summary points here. Cities are good. Uh, again, here are the advantages for which we have pretty good evidence now that on average cities yield these effects compared to, to non-urban areas. Not only rural areas, but, but non-urban areas. Uh, 
higher economic productivity, higher wages, more jobs, better health, more tolerance, better quality of life, and better for the environment. So let me start with productivity. Uh, most of us know the story about innovation. Uh, lots of things go into innovation, but one thing cities add because of density is serendipitous encounters, interaction between people. So not just the folks in your office or at your factory, but people you might meet on the street in a coffee shop, getting on and off the, the train uh, or the bus, uh, in the parking lot, in a restaurant, wherever it might be. 10 minute conversation or two hour conversation might yield nothing, but it also might yield a tweak to the way you work or the way your company operates or an idea for a brand new business. And you pool enough of these things together and you get a lot of innovation. We know pretty clearly that on average cities, even controlling for uh, population, yield more innovation than non-urban areas. Um, but there are other contributors here too. So one is economies of scale and infrastructure. It simply costs less because you're sharing things like land, electricity, heating in buildings, transportation. There tends to be better labor market matching. That's a function of density. So the more people there are in a particular area, the more likely an individual can find a job and an employer that fits her or his skills and desires, and vice versa too. It's easier for firms to find people that match the traits they need in a job when there's a, a larger labor pool in a, the immediate area. Over the long run, this might change. If everything moves online, then you don't necessarily need, you're not confined to the people in your local area, but so far, uh, this has been an important feature, an important reason for the productivity advantage. And then specialization, uh, same thing. Lots of suppliers around, more likely that you're gonna be able to rely, uh, even if one uh, uh, goes through a two month strike or uh, lots of people get sick or it goes out of business, you've got others that you can turn to. This allows you to engage in greater specialization, which all else equal leads to, tends to lead to higher productivity. Higher productivity on average, this is certainly not always the case, but on average leads to higher wages. And we see this in, uh, in urban areas and cities as well. And it turns out that at least so far, and this is surprising to some, the wage advantage in cities compared to non-urban areas tends to be greater at the low end of the labor market than in the high end. That's largely because these days the, the main uh, economic source of productivity in, uh, in cities and growth in cities is high-end services. Used to be manufacturing, now it's services. Lots of the finance, uh, cultural specialization and, and a variety of, uh, of related things, educational sector and, and so on, um, biotechnology and, and uh, other related sciences and healthcare fields. Um, these tend to pay quite high wages uh, compared to the average in countries and that means that there's a, a lot of um, money available for consumption for low-end services. Given this, it turns out that the wage difference is greater at the low end, or has been greater for the last 30 years or so, at the low, the wage difference between cities and non-urban areas has tended to be greater at the low end of the labor market than at the high end, which is surprising to some, but, uh, but interesting and important. Um, I'll come back to this. Um, Sometimes higher wages mean fewer jobs, but that turns out not to be the case on average in cities. And again, this comes back to consumption. So there's enough demand, uh, given the nature of the types of jobs that pay high wages and given the wages that they pay, uh, that there's sufficient demand for uh, lots of employment despite high wages at the low end of the labor market. Um, people in cities have always, and this was true during COVID as well, been more vulnerable to contracting communicable diseases, infectious diseases, when they live in high density areas. Uh, that all else being equal should lead to worse health outcomes. But it turns out that on average, this is more than compensated for by the fact that, again, due to population density, there's more and better healthcare services in cities. It's easier to get to them, you can get to them quicker. Uh, and there are more doctors, even per capita, and better machinery, better technology. And this tends to, I mean, it's not automatically the case, but it turns out that it's true that this tends to outweigh the, the danger. Uh, even during COVID, so the story in my country at the beginning of COVID was that New York City and Seattle were in a horrible position. The, the pandemic spread through these cities uh, like wildfire, and lots of people died initially. 
By the end of the pandemic, I guess it officially ended May 23, the death rate was higher in non-urban areas than in urban areas, despite this huge uh, opposite uh, uh, pattern at the very beginning, and it was because of the healthcare services. Tolerance tends to be greater in urban areas, uh, and this goes to a variety of reasons, some not surprising, um, um, and one or two maybe partly surprising. So partly it's just due to greater education and affluence, which is not so much a city effect, but an effect of the people who tend to live in cities, again, at least uh, in the last 30 years or so. But it's also due to greater diversity. And one of the reasons you have greater diversity in cities is that they're large enough and dense enough that they support a critical mass of various types of minority groups. And that encourages more to move there. So if there are two people from your particular group, whether it's a religious group, a racial or ethnic group, a certain type of immigrant or something else, in a small town, you might not be so tempted to move there, but if there are 500 such people in a big city, that makes it much more attractive. So the beginnings of diversity coupled with density spawn more diversity, and that tends to help with tolerance. This also, population density also increases contact between groups, more people are passing by each other or walking three blocks and encountering a different group as opposed to having to drive uh, an hour. Quality of life is also tends to be better in, uh, in urban areas. So one of the key reasons here is that violence has declined a lot in, in cities since the 1990s. This is a big problem, which I'll come back to in a couple of minutes, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and uh, in the early 1990s. But cities also have better restaurants, cafes, bars, clubs. They're a lot cleaner than they used to be. Public spaces have been uh, significantly improved in many cities, from parks to libraries to bike lanes. Uh, cities have added, city governments have added more of these things. There's more public transportation. There are more options for transportation. It's easier to walk now than it used to be. So they're more interesting, friendly, safe, varied, uh, which has led uh, uh, in part to the, the surge in population, which has been mostly good, but also led to some problems, which I'll come back to. And then lastly, maybe not surprisingly, although some find this surprising, cities tend to be more environmentally sustainable. So housing units are smaller, they require less in the way of energy to heat and cool and, and light. Um, large buildings, whether commercial or residential, share walls and they're stacked vertically. This yields economies of scale and heat. Heat filters up through the building and so you don't have to use as much energy to uh, achieve the same degree of heating. More people walk, bike, they ride the subway or bus and they drive shorter distances when they do drive so they're using less, uh, uh, less fuel. Uh, at some point this will be largely irrelevant when our all cars are powered by uh, electric batteries or hydrogen or, or something else, some other type of clean energy. But today, and at least over the next several decades, that matters a lot. Cities also are less destructive of land and, lab, uh, land and water and, uh, and other species. So urban areas co to cover, excuse me, only about 3% of the, the world's population. This is surprising to some people. It was to me when I first heard it, but it's it's true. Uh, it's also easier to reduce and repair things and recycle uh, when population is concentrated, as it is in urban areas. Now, um, with respect to environmental sustainability, isn't it the case that people prefer suburbs? I'm going to come back to this in, in just a moment, but uh, it's worth raising here, and it's certainly a true fact. That's especially true of people um, in... At, uh, key child uh, rearing age, so roughly age 35 to, to 55. Um, and that's fine as it happens. We don't need everybody to live in super high density areas to get these benefits. Uh, more people living in cities yields the benefits, but uh, we can accept good enough, try to do a little bit better. We don't necessarily need perfection in terms of, uh, of getting all these gains. What we should try to do, I think, uh, and this is what the, most of the rest of this talk is going to be about, is to make it easier and more attractive for people to live in or close to the center. Um, I said before that uh, we're far less confident about the particular recommendations that we make, the degree to which they'll yield the same benefits in middle income and poor countries. But these advantages of cities 
uh, seem to be, if anything, actually greater in developing countries than they are in the rich democratic countries. That is to say, the productivity advantage, the wage advantage, the quality of life advantage, and, and environmental sustainability advantage, and so on. So that's important to note. Uh, now let me say just a couple of things about the, the first part of the message, which is that people like cities. Um, I think if I were given, giving this kind of talk several decades ago, the next question after highlighting the advantages or the benefits of urban areas would have been, so what can we do to reverse the movement away from cities? Because in the 70s and 80s and through, depending on the city and the country, at least part of the 1990s, that's exactly what was happening. There was a shift from people having uh, either stayed in cities or moved to cities to them increasingly uh, moving away. But the reversal that we would have needed, had I been asking this question, how can we achieve that reversal? It's happened. So you can see this. These are data, including some projections going forward for the 20 or so rich, long-standing democratic nations. And you can see mostly a rise or at best a flat trend uh, since the end of World War II up until around the 1970s, 1980s, where the line either flattens out or dips a bit for a number, not all, but a number of the countries. But then by the early 2000s, it begins to rise again, sometimes rapidly, sometimes slowly. And the projections, which of course could be wrong, um, I just suggested that 30 years ago people were projecting, experts were projecting that people would continue to leave cities, in fact, maybe even leave them more rapidly. That turned out to be wrong. So things can change, but the, the best projections we have now suggest that, that this trend toward increasing movement toward urban or into urban areas is going to increase. And this is happening even more rapidly in poorer nations. Uh, the UN currently is projecting that by the middle of the century, the urban population share worldwide is going to be about 68%, which is not far below what it currently is uh, in the rich democracies. So this is what, uh, in the rich democracies, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion people, so eight billion-ish worldwide. Uh, so most people live outside these countries. That's what's driving this uh, trend here, or a big part of what's driving this trend. You can see currently the, the urban share worldwide is about 56%, so up by 12-ish percentage points in another two and a half decades or so. Um, and then the last thing I'll note here is that population movement has been not only toward cities and urban areas, but um, particularly toward large cities. Uh, more than 25% of people around the world live in metro areas that have a million people or more. And the 20 biggest metro areas in the world now have roughly half a billion people, which 500 years ago was all of us. Uh, and is right now, what is that, 1 16th, I guess, of the, of the world population. So they're moving into cities, but particularly big cities. Not only big cities, but particularly big cities. Um, uh, you will be wondering, I assume, whether work from home, uh, a legacy of COVID, but had already begun before COVID, certainly accelerated during the, the pandemic, whether this is gonna fundamentally alter the story. Um, it could, I suppose, but it's looking more and more like it probably won't much, probably a little bit, but likely not too much. In uh, 2022 and 23, the share of people who work fully remotely has declined pretty significantly. We could be at the end of that, might stop at its current level, but it wouldn't surprise me if it continues to decline, not to the level prior to COVID, but uh, to a much smaller level than, uh, than some were projecting during and, and shortly after uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, it's also really important to note, and I'll say a bit more about this too, that people like cities for quality of life, not just, uh, not just for work. Work is certainly an important draw, but quality of life turns out to be too, and it may be becoming more important. Okay, now here's what I want to focus on. Um, we would benefit if cities were better. They're already good compared to non-urban areas on average. It would be good if they were better. Uh, we think they can be, and we think we know something about, um, about how to do that. This is not, 
I should say, a story about the politics of how to get these policies in place. It's about the policies and institutions uh, and the good that they might do. The politics is really interesting, but it's a, it's a separate story. So I want to I want to make that clear. Um, okay, let me start with economic success because it's important in its own right, and it's long been uh, one of city's key economic advantages. So uh, a fairly common view says that the core objective of government with respect to uh, the economy should be to boost economic growth. But it turns out that we don't really know very much about how to do that. That might surprise some of you, and if you think I'm wrong, feel free to tell me, or at least ask about it later on. Uh, but, uh, but I think it's correct. It's especially true in the rich democratic countries. We know a little bit more about keys to development, although less than most people think. Development meaning how countries can move from being poor to middle income and middle income to rich. We also don't know much about how to engineer economic success in cities. Um, it's not that we know nothing, but we don't know very much. So attracting successful firms has long been a core of the strategy. On average, doesn't tend to yield much benefit, and when it does yield a benefit, it tends to be temporary. We know that clusters of firms in particular sectors or, uh, or industries or product lines help, but it turns out it's really hard to create them. Most successful clusters have been more or less accidents of history. You can help them, but try to create them from scratch is not easy to do. There's a, a, a long line of failures here. Um, that's okay, though. That's not the end of the world. Local governments and other actors can focus usefully on creating policies and institutions that basically enhance capabilities, especially ec economic capabilities. So boosting skills, help helping business startups, assisting clusters that already exist or look like they're going to become successful clusters, supporting anchor institutions like universities and hospitals and others. Indeed, boosting capabilities, we think, is the core theme of what cities can do most effectively. And so I'm going to talk about a number of areas in which cities, local governments, and those that are supporting them, from private sector actors to nonprofits to higher level governments uh, and individuals, can do to, to try to help this. These are core needs that we have, things that are important and valuable, and things that cities can help with. Let me start with safety. Uh, pretty basic human need, but safety is also really important for spillover effects. When people don't feel safe, almost everything else goes wrong. They do worse in school, they're less likely to start up a business, they're like, less likely to stay employed, they participate less frequently in civic activities, their political preferences become more selfish. So safety is really fundamental and this is a big part of what went wrong in a lot of, not all, but a lot of urban areas beginning in the 1960s and lasting through the 1990s. A big part of the reason why people did start to move out of cities and why the dominant projection, uh, at least into the 1990s, was that that was going to continue and maybe even accelerate. Um, the good news long term is that that experience in those two or three decades, depending again on the city and the country, um, was a blip. Um, long term violence has been decreasing pretty steadily, pretty clearly. Uh, especially in the rich democratic nations, but in other countries too, not in every country, but in other countries too. Um, it looks very much like the key going forward is widely shared prosperity, public goods and services that assure everyone has an opportunity to flourish, uh, better support for mental health, this is something we ought to do for a variety of reasons, and appropriate gun regulations. This last thing is really important to my own country. We don't have them for the most part. There is, however, some good news, even for countries like this that don't currently have them, and here's one area in which I'm pretty pessimistic. We actually have made a, a tiny bit of progress in the United States, mostly at the state level, but it's really tiny and it's under threat now from the particular composition of the Supreme Court. But anyway, in countries that lack these, such as the US, we can nevertheless make progress through uh, a variety of, of, of policies or, and programs that um, now have a fairly substantial evidence base. So one is heavy police presence in high crime areas. A second is technology, surveillance cameras, and DNA databases. Not everybody wants these things. Some people prefer a lot more privacy. That's a political debate that will happen at the local and, and other levels, perhaps. But they do tend to work in terms of deterring crime, especially violent crime. 
Uh, support for, and this is a, a long sort of slog, it's hard work, but support for creation and efficacy of community organizations. Uh, and then lastly, and this is relatively new, but turns out to, again, have a significant evidence base now. So for individuals who you can identify or try to identify in various ways at risk of committing violence, uh, very intense personalized services, especially cognitive behavioral therapy, have yielded some real uh, promising results. Still much better to have good gun regulations, but if you're not going to, uh, and maybe even if you do, uh, these other programs can help. Effective design of public goods and spaces also can improve safety, in particular for vulnerable groups. So this, these are fairly simple and seemingly obvious solutions, good lighting, camera monitoring in public spaces, uh, and an abundance of single person toilets. Every city I go to, just as an aside now, I walk around and look for public toilets. It's a one useful indicator, I think, of how seriously the local government takes quality of life and human well-being. I mean, it's also partly a function of affluence, of course. It's a different story in a rich democratic, in a city in a rich democratic society than it is in a, in a poor country. But it's, a, it's one of these signals, along with attention to mental health, that I think give you a, a good idea of how high up the, uh, the ladder a city or a society is in, in getting close to that good society ideal that we might want to achieve. Uh, okay, what about health? As I noted earlier, um, people in cities tend to be healthier and live longer. They are more vulnerable to infectious diseases, but their easier access to more and better healthcare services tends to outweigh this. But in affluent countries and increasingly in other countries too, the main threat to health, the main source of health problems nowadays is chronic diseases, uh, especially heart disease and cancer, but not only these things. And these tend to be due more to behavior than to lack of, that is the problem is more due to behavior than to lack of healthcare services. Healthcare services health, obviously, but, um, but behavioral changes make more of a difference if you can achieve them. And here is where local public health agencies can play a potentially very important role in getting people to improve behavior a little bit, more than a little bit, maybe a lot in ideal circumstances. So cutting down on smoking, limiting out drug and alcohol use, eating better, walking more, connecting with other people, managing stress, sleeping better, I guess I should have added. All of these things seem to now have a fairly solid evidence base in terms of uh, helping both longevity and quality of life, or healthy life expectancy, as it were, uh, and cities can potentially help. Okay, what about infrastructure? Um, I'll mention a couple of aspects of infrastructure. Um, we say, we're just throwing this out. Um, the, there's no necessary reason why this is the right answer, but we say the average per person energy usage currently in Europe as a whole, about 30,000 kilowatt hours, uh, per person. Seems like it's good enough for people to live a, quite a good life, and so maybe we should shoot for that worldwide. If we did, that is to say if on average everybody in the world, all eight-ish billion of us, uh, had this, we have to roughly double our, uh, our energy output worldwide. We can get most of the way there, we now know, and this is very, very recent that we know this, through solar and wind. Uh, and certainly if we supplement that with hydro and geothermal and nuclear and biofuels, we can uh, produce this much energy. So it's doable entirely with clean energy uh, already. And that very likely will become easier uh, as we go forward and, and uh, the technology improves even more. Um, these, uh, the, the solutions that this transition to clean energy will entail are not only going to reduce climate change, but they're actually in many respects going to make our lives uh, better, more enjoyable, maybe more thrilling. If you've driven an electric car, you know exactly what I mean. Uh, if you like uh, going really fast or moving from stationary to uh, going quite rapidly in a short amount of time, I don't, by the way, but my son does. He's uh, only 21, so that's probably not a surprise. Uh, anyway, uh, you will be very happy driving an electric car, probably, compared to one with an internal combustion engine. Uh, um, uh, they also have a lot fewer parts that can go wrong, so it's looking like they'll probably cost a lot less to repair over the life cycle and probably last a lot longer, especially as batteries improve. Uh, buses will also uh, end up being a lot quieter and there won't be smoke coming out 
uh, uh, all over the place. Heat pumps uh, will be nicer than uh, uh, the standard ways in which we've heated and cooled homes and offices for the better part of, I guess, the last century or so. Microgrids, which are uh, uh, grids where electricity is provided partly internally from rooftop solar to solar panels on parking structures nearby. So a local area could be just a block, could be uh, a district in a city, could be half of a city, could be an entire city, will be part of this grid and also get part of its energy from the larger power grid as we currently do. Uh, this is going to increase resilience. So if the whole power grid goes out for an hour or three days, um, most of these areas will turn to full use, 100% use of their microgrid, and you won't even notice an interruption. That will be much better. Retrofitted buildings will be better, potentially, in a variety of ways. We could do this really fast and really slipshod, uh, and maybe they won't turn out to be better, but we could also uh, make them considerably better um, because of the fact that we have to do this to switch over to clean energy sources. What do local governments need to do? Well, they can help in a variety of ways. Partly this is going to come through mandates by national governments and supranational bodies. But local governments also can help by requiring public utilities to switch to clean energy, creating incentives to, uh, for uh, 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 private commercial and residential buildings to do this, ensuring that public buildings and vehicles switch, uh, mandating parking structures and others to have rooftop solar, uh, making sure that charging stations can be put in all over the place and are blocked. I don't know if this is an issue in Austria at all, but in the United States it's now already becoming an issue that local neighborhoods are trying to block uh, electric charging stations being put in uh, to, to make things easier. For the same reason that, and this is something I'll come back to in just a moment, uh, that, that they block new uh, construction of new rental housing. Spoils the neighborhood or gets in my way or it's ugly or maybe I just hate the idea that I'm going to have to switch to an electric car soon. Anyway, local government can help uh, make sure those obstacles are overcome. And it can also uh, uh, remove or at least reduce a variety of rules, regulations, codes, restrictions that discourage people and organizations from shifting. So uh, in the city where I live, for example, you're not allowed to put a rooftop solar panel too close to the edge of the roof because the firefighters then, if they have to go up on the roof, they have nowhere to step. Uh, this is a very sensible objection, but it's also interpreted too literally much of the time and is, for unfortunate reasons, become a, a big problem in the installation of rooftop solar, which otherwise, in Southern California, by the way, should be everywhere. If, it, if there's anywhere on the planet where you should have a lot of rooftop solar, it's Southern California, and we do. I mean, there's, there's more and more. I live in San Diego, by the way. Um, uh, but nevertheless, there are, there are a variety of things that can slow down this process uh, and probably ought not. Okay, what about water? Well, as, as cities get bigger, and again, they are getting bigger, especially the already biggest ones, um, but also because of climate change, uh, some traditional sources of water, like aquifers and rivers, are going to become less reliable. But we already have technological solutions that probably can do the job once they're up and running. Uh, I think recycling is probably the most important one here, um, but there's also a, a more effective capturing of rainwater runoff, and depending on where you're talking about uh, use of ocean water that's desalinated also can help, but the, the recycling is going to be a huge, huge deal. Lots of people don't like the idea of drinking recycled water, right? Do you have recycled water here in Vienna? No? Okay. We just have our first plant. Uh, I believe it's now up and running or will be very soon. It's been under construction and debate for like 20 years in San Diego. Uh, and this is hard because <laughs> recycled water, yuck. Uh, but it turns out it's much, it's as clean or cleaner than the water you already drink. And so once a generation grows up drinking the stuff, they're going to wonder why their parents and grandparents we're so turned off by this. Uh, okay, um, climate change is also going to increase the number of uh, floods that cities face uh, because of more intense ra rainstorms or, again, depending on where you're located, which cities you're talking about from rising sea levels. But uh, Copenhagen, um, Copenhagen pioneered this. There's a, a, a way to install new surface infrastructure to pretty effectively manage or at least help manage stormwater keeps water out of the sewer system by capturing it, by storing it, and direct it to green spaces, 
uh, and to other plants all over the city in, uh, in various ways. We don't know exactly how effective this is for each and every type of city, but it looks very promising so far. What about solid waste? Well, here most of our discourse, I think, tends to focus on recycling, but the, in the big picture, the real key here is um, for poorer countries to shift from putting much or all of the uh, solid waste into open air dumps instead to putting it in sanitary landfills or incinerating it. Um, there are also ways that cities can help uh, improve the oceans by keep, keeping single use plastics out by limiting or maybe banning them in, entirely. Um, telecommunications, another important part of infrastructure. This is a pretty simple story. The goal here is absolutely universal, high speed internet access, probably through fiber optic cable. This is doable and it has the double advantage that when we install this stuff everywhere, you can also then move all the power lines from above ground, if they're still above ground, where they're still above ground, which they are in a lot of parts of the world, to, uh, to underground, which again makes them much more resilient. Okay, now we come to housing. Uh, I had an interesting, well interesting to me anyway, discussion with the class I'm teaching just an hour or two ago about housing in Vienna. So housing, I think, we think, is probably the most pressing and maybe the biggest policy problem, at least in the rich democratic countries facing urban policymakers these days. And this is quite recent. Uh, it didn't used to be the case, but, uh, but it's become important in the last two decades and the degree to which it's a problem seems to have accelerated. Uh, the problem is mainly the price of rental housing. It's a problem in and of itself, but also uh, recent calculations by experts uh, in this field suggest that this is either beginning to eat into or in some cities has already uh, come to offset the wage advantage of cities compared to, to non-urban areas. That is to say people are still earning a lot more in cities than they would if they lived elsewhere, but it's all going to pay their rent. Uh, either that or they live way, way outside the city and so then you have to weigh the quality of life and it's hard to weigh exactly how much a commute is worth in dollar terms, but most humans really dislike long commutes. Um, that might change a little bit when we're all driving electric cars and you know now we have podcasts, not just a few radio stations, uh, but that's just speculation. Uh, so far the evidence suggests that people strongly dislike long commutes anyway. Um, okay, so it's a, it's a big policy problem. The, the source of the problem is pretty straightforward. Demand exceeds the supply of rental housing. Um, and this is mainly because demand has increased. It's not that supply has decreased, it's that demand has increased, and it's increased a lot, especially in some cities. That's mainly for the simple reason that I, I mentioned before. Cities have changed a lot in the last several decades. They've become much more attractive much more interesting, much more diverse, much more lively, and so a lot more people want to live there, especially younger people. So an increase in demand. Why has the supply increased to match that demand? I mean, that's part of the genius of markets, right, is that when they're out of balance, the other one responds a little bit, so things come back in line and prices don't have to, to uh, change so much. Well, this is hard with housing anyway, because it takes a long time to plan and then construct a house. It's not like toothpaste or deodorant or something where uh, if demand increases a lot, the factory can just churn out a bunch more. So that's part of the issue. But the bigger problem really is that this surge in demand has been quite recent and it was really unexpected. So as I said before, 20 or 30 years ago, hardly any expert would have predicted that there would be a big surge in demand for housing in cities. The dominant narrative, the dominant viewpoint well-founded given the conditions in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and through at least part of the 1990s, was that more and more people were gonna leave cities. And it wasn't just because of the crime, it was also because of the internet. This opened up the possibility that, well, people can work from anywhere and more and more will. And given that cities were ugly and boring and unsafe, why would anyone choose to live in the city? So it wasn't anticipated. However, there is also the problem in some cities and some countries that you have a lot of regulations that make it very difficult to construct new rental housing. So even where developers would otherwise have been building a lot of new rental housing, sometimes they can't. This is particularly a problem in cities in the United States. There are a variety of things, all of which were put in place for very understandable and mostly very well-intentioned reasons. 
from height restrictions to minimum parking requirements, zoning regulations that allow local neighborhood groups to have the final word on any construction of, uh, of new housing, uh, some regulations that allow only single family uh, houses for purchase in an area. There's not even a debate. You simply cannot construct new rental housing there. Historic preservation rules where, you know, if you have a house where a famous writer lived for six months, a hundred years ago, uh, it needs to be protected. I'm not in principle opposed to doing this, but if too much of this happens, then you, you make it very difficult to build new rental housing. And environmental review mandates, again, which were put in place for very understandable, well-intentioned reasons, but now sometimes uh, drag out this process for, at least in the United States, for three years, five years, sometimes 15 years to get permission to build a, a new apartment building on a, on a piece of land. Um, okay, what do we do? Uh, we think there are two main options, and obviously there are various combinations and other possibilities, but these seem to be the most successful cases here. So one is the Tokyo strategy, uh, just deregulate almost everything. You make it possible for almost anyone who owns a plot of land to build essentially whatever they want. There, it's, that's an exaggeration, there are some restrictions, but they're very minimal. Uh, and Tokyo has been pretty successful in increasing the supply of housing so that rental prices are pretty average and certainly well below what you would expect for what's widely considered a superstar city, uh, not just within its country, but, uh, but worldwide. And then the other is the Vienna model. And I, you know, I say this not just because we're here, but because Vienna has a particular strategy that seems to have proven quite effective. Uh, may or may not be replicable elsewhere. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic, but um, not too many cities that I know of have tried really aggressively to do this in a way that Vienna does. Anyway, the core is extensive public and uh, so-called social, uh, not-for-profit or limited profit uh, housing, which my understanding uh, encompasses about 50% of renters in Vienna with high income limits. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of Viennese apparently are eligible. Now my students uh, uh, told me today that it's, eh, it's not quite so simple as that. There are other conditions that uh, you often have to comply with uh, and there may be some waiting. And so just throwing out this 80% figure is probably a bit misleading. But anyway, the, the broader point is simply providing a lot of supply of housing uh, through the government or supported by the government that's outside the private sector is another way to both increase the supply and also help reduce rental prices in the private market. Because if you have a lot of housing, not just a little, but a lot of housing where the price is kept lower than the market rate, uh, that's going to influence the, the market rate itself. Okay, but it's not just this. That, that we think, and um, the more and more studies that are done on this, the more and more uh, evidence that gets compiled, it looks very much like the, the housing supply problem is the, the core of this. Uh, so we think what we've said so far is the key, but there's more to it than that. Even if you can keep rental prices relatively low, there are going to be some individuals and families with incomes that are so low that you need to support them in other ways. And there are various ways to provide some sort of financial subsidy. You probably want to provide some support to evicted renters, not necessarily prevent eviction, but help people who are uh, evicted. The, the risk, if you make it too hard to evict anybody, is that developers won't build anything. Now, if you have a huge public or social sector, maybe that's not such a big problem, but for many cities, it, uh, it may be. Um, homelessness is a big and seemingly growing problem, although, as I told my students to their surprise, homelessness has actually decreased in the United States in the last 15 years, not massively, it certainly hasn't gone away. In some respects, it's more visible now, or feels more visible than it was, but it actually has gone down. We have very good data. Uh, in the United States on the quantity of, of homelessness. Anyway, uh, housing first strategy seems to be quite effective. The idea here is quite simple. Instead of providing temporary housing or instead of providing services to address mental health needs or addiction problems or other behavioral uh, or personality or psychological or emotional problems that people have and then giving them permanent housing, you just give them permanent housing and then provide the services. Seems counterintuitive, but there's, a, again, a growing evidence base that this proves quite effective at reducing uh, homelessness over the long run. Doesn't 
solve the problem, but helps. And then maybe rent control too. This has been a long-standing debate, especially in the economics profession. There are plenty of instances where rent control has not helped, uh, mainly because it stifles or reduces construction of new housing, but sometimes it works. Berlin is a good example of a city where it's done pretty well for a long time. There's now some new debate about whether it's sort of run its course and maybe at the end of the road, but in any event. So we're not recommending that as the core of a strategy, but it, it probably can help if it's a subsidiary, a secondary element, or maybe it can help. Um, it's worth asking the question, well, why not just deal with this by subsidizing sprawl? Uh, I mean, this is what a number of American cities have done effectively since World War II, since cars and highways facilitated people living well outside the city and still being able to get to their job. Houston is the classic American city, an example of this. Los Angeles also is, although surprisingly, Los Angeles is a more dense city than most people think for peculiar reasons. But anyway, it's, it's worth asking the question, why not do that? Well, one pretty obvious answer is it's not good environmentally. Again, 30 years from now, if we're all driving electric or hydrogen power cars or some other clean energy source, maybe it's not a big deal, but now it is, and every little bit matters over the coming decades, so it's probably not a good choice. Turns out it's also expensive. So for a long time, urban planners have presumed that if you allow people and uh, facilitate their movement outside the city, that they would bring enough tax revenues in order to pay for the infrastructure. But recent calculations suggest not so much. When you take in the long-term repair and replacement costs, the only ones that pay for themselves are pretty dense inner suburbs and then, of course, the inner city themselves, the outer lying suburbs. And depending on the city, you don't actually have to go that far out to reach that tipping point where it becomes costly rather than cost-saving in order to uh, encourage this movement out of the, of the center. And then also for people with low income, and we know more about this now, especially in the United States, we have a pretty good database on this. Uh, transportation costs often eat up at least partly and sometimes all of the savings on housing. So you're paying less in rent, or maybe if you're purchasing a house too, uh, if you live further out, but uh, your housing costs are, or excuse me, your transportation costs are, are greater, maybe a lot greater. Okay, what about transportation itself? Uh, the things we want here, we want it to be convenient, affordable, environmentally friendly, and safe. The standard approach of the left for a long time has been to say trains and subways. That's the key. They're great um, where they already exist. But there's now a lot of rethinking about what to do in cities where they don't already exist. Do you put them in anyway? Los Angeles has done this in the last 20 years, for example. It's a sprawling American city. They've now put in a really good subway system. It hasn't helped a whole lot. The problem is not enough people live near the lines. Los Angeles was already too spread out, so really well-intentioned. And down the road, who knows, things might change. If the city's able to subsidize construction of a lot of housing right along those lines, maybe things will get a lot better. But uh, if you don't already, if you're a city that doesn't already have this, so I'm not talking about Vienna here, uh, but if you don't already have it, it, it might be worth considering uh, focusing instead on buses, shuttles, cars, doing everything you can to accelerate the, the switch to, to clean energy cars, to electric cars. But these things allow for much greater flexibility already for people whose commute isn't a straight in and out. Uh, you can do it fairly effectively. It's not always easy, but you, you can. And they also allow for more flexibility going forward. So again, we don't want to at all suggest that trains and subways are, are not worthwhile. Just that if they don't already exist and, and can be improved, that it, it might be worth rethinking the traditional assumption that it's always the right thing to do. How do we reduce traffic congestion? Well, congestion pricing looks more and more like it's a, a good solution. It doesn't completely solve the problem but it definitely helps. You wanna make mass transportation, whatever it is, more effective. So build, as I just suggested, build a lot of housing nearby. Where you have buses, give them dedicated lanes. Ensure they arrive every 10 or 15 minutes. There's a great deal of evidence now that as long as buses are arriving within 15 minutes, people don't look at the schedule, they just go, because they know one's gonna show up pretty. And that makes a huge difference in how many people use buses. I mean, you'd think that these days it's pretty easy to look at a schedule, but that seemingly is sufficient to deter a lot of people 
from, uh, from using buses. They'll find other ways to do it instead. But if they don't have to look at a schedule, uh, then they just go uh, and they use the bus. And then you, you want a smartphone app, ideally one that can integrate all different sources of transportation. So somebody who lives in a near, uh, uh, nearby suburb or maybe even an outlying suburb, they should be able to get into the app and say, I'm going from here to here, and then pops up the whole route. So you take the rail line for a while, then you jump on a scooter or a bike, and then you walk over here. So it tells you how to do it, but then it also integrates the payment. You know, you just have it uh, charge your card or, or whatever, make the whole thing easiest. And then maybe most surprisingly and controversially, uh, you can try getting rid of some roads. Um, this is counterintuitive because, of course, you think if there's a lot of traffic congestion, you build more lanes, build more roads. But we know that as long as there's latent demand, that is to say, as long as there are some people out there who aren't driving currently or aren't driving as much as they would just because there's a lot of congestion, if you put more lanes on the roads, they're going to start driving and the roads fill up again, usually within six months to three years. Uh, so maybe go in the other direction. And Seoul is the city most famously that did this. They had, uh, Seoul was growing uh, a lot after World War II. By the 1970s, they had a lot of co uh, congestion. So they decided to pave over a, a nice stream that ran through the city with the new highway. It immediately filled up. Congestion didn't uh, improve at all. A couple of decades later, in the early 2000s, a mayor said, yeah, maybe we should just give up and uh, get rid of the expressway, get rid of the highway and put the stream back. So they did, and it turned out it worked. Didn't change congestion much at all. There was no more congestion, in other words. Uh, and now they had this nice uh, stream. In other words, people who had been using that highway found other ways. There was no complaints. There's no controversy about this. It's not a, wasn't a political loser at all. Now, it may or may not be replicable. We don't, we don't know, but it's worth uh, considering, worth trying especially because of this well-established property that, uh, that there tends to be latent demand that will fill up, when you, when you go in the fill up the roads when you go in the opposite direction. How do we increase safety? Um, there are a variety of things to do, but important ones include reducing driving by the young and the, the elderly. Uh, automated cars are probably going to be a, a useful part of the solution here, but already in my country, the United States, there's been a huge increase in the share of young, especially boys, who don't get a driver's license when they turn 16. That's when you're eligible to drive uh, on your own in the United States. So there's a cultural shift going on uh, among the younger, younger generation that's already helping here. Part of the story almost certainly is just smartphones. So we know uh, that smartphones and social media have led people to spend more time on their phone at home or very close by instead of going out, driving to their friend's house, driving to a bar, driving out to go on a date or, or whatever. It's not that we want to necessarily prevent any of this, but it, it, all things equal, it, it helps if the drivers who are most likely to get in accidents are driving less. Uh, but there are other things that we can do. And then redesigning city streets and intersections um, are another obvious solution. Skills are a huge part of the capabilities that should, cities should be focusing on. There are lots of things to do here. Um, I'm not going to belabor this. I'm happy to talk about details if you want. But these are really, really important. And we, we have a very good understanding of, of how to do a lot of this. Um, ironically, given its centrality and given the volume of academic research on this, the thing that we probably know the least about how to change and do successfully is K through 12 education. Uh, every year or five years, there's a new hypothesis about the secret to success in elementary and secondary school education. And there have been literally thousands and thousands of research studies on this. Some of them really, really good from a scientific perspective um, uh, in terms of doing randomized controlled trials. Uh, others making use of very, very high quality evidence. And I think we're still well short of uh, unlocking any sort of secret key to, uh, to uh, successful K through 12 education. So uh, the key so far, or at this moment in time, I think is to, to continue to try and to continue to, to pay attention. But maybe, maybe not be quite so influenced by these wild swings in the, the latest fad of the moment or the, the latest secret of the moment, whether it comes from Finland or, uh, or, or wherever. Uh, whoever had done really well on the latest PISA uh, tests. Um, okay, then the last uh, capability here uh, I'll talk about, and then I'm going to conclude, uh, is incomes. 
So the, the core contribution to living standards by local governments really is the provision of public goods and services. These uh, both enhance people's capabilities, but also just give them stuff that they would otherwise have to pay for, which makes their lives better. Not always. We certainly could improve government performance, uh, but generally speaking, a lot of these goods and services do. But government can also boost uh, incomes directly, local government. And usually that means adding on top of a program that exists at the central or regional level. Although in some countries, local governments have a lot more authority to directly implement particular programs. So we're talking about things like a higher minimum wage and earning subsidy and supplements to various public insurance programs. Um, it's worth mentioning here urban poverty and mentioning that like with economic growth and the creation of city or urban economic success, we know surprisingly little about how to transform high poverty neighborhoods. We've tried lots of things. We've studied this a lot. Sometimes we make progress, but uh, most of the time we fail. Eventually, gentrification tends to solve this problem. That is to say a neighborhood goes from being high poverty to not high poverty, sometimes to exactly its opposite. Um, so here, too, we recommend focusing on capabilities. Local government ought to ensure that people are safe, that schools are good to the extent it can, uh, make it easy to create and expand a business, provide supportive services and public goods, and then also make it possible for people to opt out uh, uh, of uh, high poverty or relatively high poverty neighborhoods by facilitating movement. And there are various ways to do this. But one of the keys, a couple of recent studies suggested, have suggested is making sure that people know that uh, whether you're subsidizing this movement to a, from or to a particular neighborhood or, or something else, a lot of people don't know about the program uh, in some of the programs that have been tried in the past. And, and so make sure, making sure that they do uh, turns out to be pretty critical. What about urban inequality? Here too, staying on the, the general topic of incomes. Well, inequality of income and as best we can tell, although data are a lot newer and sparser, wealth also within cities has been increasing. And this is not just, I mean, it is an American phenomenon, but it's not only an American phenomenon. It's a problem, um, and it's especially a problem if this has lots of spillover effects, and there are a variety of hypotheses about how income inequality is bad for uh, health, for democracy, economic growth, happiness, and a variety of other outcomes. Um, I actually think the evidence base doesn't provide much, the evidence base we have doesn't provide much support for these worrisome hypotheses. So, uh, I mean, I, I still feel pretty strongly on fairness grounds that we ought to try for less inequality, but I'm not as worried as many uh, other academics seem to be. Uh, I don't really have a good sense of policy, how policymakers feel about this, but at least academics, that uh, income inequality, whether at the national level or at the city level, uh, is a, a big problem because of its spillover or knock-on effects. The other thing well worth mentioning here, I think, and this is important at all levels, but probably especially at the local level, is that where government provides a, a really uh, large, robust set of public goods and services, inequality of living standards is going to be a lot less than it is of income or wealth because lots of people at the low end are getting access to the same sorts of things people in the middle and people at the top do. Okay, I'm going to skip over discussion about various types of taxes and other sources of financial support. Happy to talk about it later. And a, a little bit we wanted to say about democracy and, uh, and policy making. Um, just a couple things about possible hurdles. Uh, and these are just questions that we've come across that we think are worth saying something uh, about. Some of them are much more complicated. Some are fairly straightforward, like this one. So there is this concern that some cities are going to become unwieldy. That could happen. Uh, some cities, especially a couple in sub-Saharan Africa, are projected to rise to maybe, maybe 80 million population by the end of this century. Uh, we have no prior experience with this, so we just don't know. But uh, Tokyo currently has about 35 million people. Seoul, 25 million. New York City, 20 million. They all function reasonably well enough. They're, they have problems, to be sure, but they're not unwieldy, as best we can tell. Will climate change doom cities? 
Uh, there are going to be some cities that are going to lose population because of climate change, almost certainly now. Um, hopefully not too many, but, uh, but some will. Uh, in Bangladesh, in the eastern coast of China, Miami, probably in the United States. But probably a lot of the migration, the climate-caused migration, is it going to end up being from rural areas into cities. Um, we have some prior experience with large-scale migration in a relatively short period of time. The most recent one is the massive movement of people from western China to eastern China, coastal cities. China is a very different context from other parts, but the mechanics of enormous numbers of people in a very short span of time moving from one area to another into an urban area, we do have some experience with and can learn from that. Doesn't mean we'll necessarily solve this, but it, uh, it does mean it's not an entirely new problem to have. There's a, a fairly common hypothesis now that uh, only a very small subset of cities are likely to uh, thrive, to do really well, and those are the the so-called brain hubs, cities like San Francisco and others that have a lot of innovation that are at the tech forefront or San Jose in California, which is right next to Silicon Valley. Um, we think this is fundamentally wrong. Uh, ordinary second tier cities that don't have thriving technology or biotech industries or a lot of high finance can do just fine. Yeah, they, they might not be quite as rich. Uh, they might not have quite as fast economic growth as some of the superstar cities, but that's okay. You can still have uh, lots and lots of people living a perfectly good life, uh, doing ordinary, somewhat less glamorous work. And in fact, if work from home does become a really significant presence, some of these cities might actually gain population. Because again, people will wanna, instead of living in London and New York City where the rents are really, really high, Maybe they move somewhere else, which is possibly not their first choice, but they can work from home and pay a lot less in rent. Um, what do we do about declining cities? Big problem, especially in my country, uh, the United States, because there are a lot, especially ones that have lost, that formerly relied on manufacturing employment and have lost it relatively quickly. Here, too, the main message we have is that we don't have a, a lot of good evidence about how to turn this around. But we do have a fair amount of evidence about how to make it okay, not catastrophic. And again, the core is to focus on people's capabilities, provide some good public goods and services, help educate people, maintain infrastructure, and significantly, if you're willing, welcome the immigrants to come in to help revitalize the economy and fill up the uh, loss of ha uh, housing. Detroit in the United States is maybe a worst case scenario of a formerly really affluent successful city that has completely changed in 50 years, but is now beginning to revitalize. We don't know how this story is gonna end. Maybe it's gonna take a very long time. Maybe it's not gonna happen at all. Maybe it's gonna happen quickly. There are some positive signs, but we just don't know yet. Anyway, it's a, it's a good lesson, something to, to watch, something to look at. Okay. Let me stop uh, again just by quickly summarizing. Uh, we're not trying to suggest that everybody has to live in a super high density place. We're not suggesting that countries take strong aggressive measures to try to force people to move back into cities and high density suburbs. We certainly don't think people should, or excuse me, government should prohibit people if they want from living in far out exurbs or small towns or rural areas. Uh, we simply wanna say again, uh, lots of people seem to like living in cities or near them. Cities have some beneficial effects. We can continue them and maybe even make them better with some policies, that, policies and institutions that already are in existence, so we don't merely have to hypothesize or speculate. We just need to try to put these things in place and then uh, see what happens. That's it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Lane, uh, for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, listening to your talk, uh, being an inhabitant of Vienna, I thought quite a few of the recommendations uh, have at least moved on for a few steps. And uh, in the opinion of uh, expats, Vienna is a city with an extremely high quality of life, although other surveys suggest that they would prefer the city without the Viennese. <laughs> 
So, the floor is open for questions to Lane. Please. What is, according to you, belief is the mo the best managed city in the world? And uh, because, like, there are opinions that it's Dubai, or is it more Vienna, or what is? <laughs> and, yes, what is your opinion? Okay, is this on? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I don't have an opinion about this. Uh, you know, we can rely on rankings. I think you know, the, the these things are. Difficult, of course, if one were going to construct an indicator not taking into account people's views, uh, but instead just objective criteria. There are a variety of things we could look at, and there are rankings that try to do this. There are other rankings that rely entirely on subjective opinion. So you just ask people what they like or where they think quality of life is high, or are they happy with their living situation, and then average that out and rank countries that way. So I, I feel like the agencies and researchers uh, and organizational bodies who do this kind of thing are much better, uh, in much better shape to answer that question than uh, I am. Uh, I will say that, as you probably know, Vienna tends to rank quite highly in these rankings. Uh, this is my first time in Vienna. I've been here five days. Uh, it's quite nice. <laughs> Just from the perspective of someone walking around and sitting in coffee shops and uh, and talking with some people. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know, but there are lots of attempts to, to answer that question using a variety of criteria. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes, hi. Thank you for your insightful lecture. Uh, I want to ask you about housing. And I have to admit, I was somewhat surprised that in combating housing shortage, you didn't address vacant housing in big cities. So the data shows that, for example, in cities like New York or London, there's a lot of I mean, many, many housing units which are vacant and which are either vacant for speculative reasons or are simply unused. And to maybe to follow up on this, I wanted to ask about intervening in private markets. You seem not to be very keen into intervening in, in markets at all. For example, housing market, other than rent control, I think there is a whole toolbox of ways one could, let's say, you make use of the vacant housing, which is either, as I say, speculatively developed just to laundry money or, or for whatever shady reasons or simply unused. As also we know from the decaying cities like Detroit, that a lot of yeah, units were unused or were, now are getting transformed. So if you would elaborate on this. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. From my perspective, and I think I speak for my co-author, Joel, uh, here as well, this is a purely pragmatic question. So if intervening in private markets works, uh, then absolutely go ahead. And, and I, I, I tried to express that view with respect to rent control. So uh, there are some analysts who think you have to decide one or the other, either never use rent control uh, or always use it. And that, that, this question, we think, uh, should be addressed more pragmatically. And so the same is true with vacant housing. If there's a lot of it and if there is a, a reason and a way to effectively make use of it, in a way that would make a difference to the uh, rental prices on the housing market or simply to dealing with, uh, uh, with the housing problem, then um, I'm certainly not against it. I don't have a problem with it. I, I haven't seen data on this, and so I'm not at all certain how big a, an issue this is. Um, and I suspect that it's bigger in some cities than others. In Manhattan, I'm very skeptical that is to say, New York City, very skeptical that it would make any difference at all. The, the problem there is a, a massive shortage of housing at the low end of the labor market, and it's very hard for me to imagine that there's enough vacant housing to, to make much of a difference in altering that situation. But I could be wrong. Okay, thank you for the question. There's one more. I've seen one hand up here. Okay. <laughs> well, there, we still have some uh, time for further questions. But if that is not the case, yeah, there's one more, please. 
Um, hello and thank you, one more time. Um, the question is, there was a part on uh, paying, how are the countries going to pay, um, how are the cities going to pay for all of these uh, benefits? Um, and you said you would happily uh, talk about it, so there's a question yeah, for that. Good. So, uh, cities can, of course, use their existing sources of revenue. There are two main ones, so they generate their own taxes. Uh, and then the second one is they rely on national and regional governments. So that's the first choice. Try to get more from your existing taxes, whether that means cutting down on tax non-payment or slight increases, tweaks to uh, the tax levels. Try to get more from the central government or regional government or both, ideally. Um, but this probably can only take you so far. and there, there may be other ways to help. So one is for cities to do a very careful inventory of their assets, especially their land assets. On average, uh, in the countries for which we have data, cities, that is to say local government, tends to own about half of the land in the city. But they don't always value this. If they did, they can... Uh, uh, create uh, a, uh, a fund and uh, use this to either borrow or improve their credit rating so that their other borrowing comes at lower interest rates. If they really systematically valued their assets and also their liabilities, uh, it looks very much like a typical city would be able to utilize this to either directly generate revenue or to, again, have uh, smaller repayments because you, you're borrowing at a lower interest rate. Uh, given your assets. And then another possibility, which the idea for which has been around for 150 years or so, but only a few cities have really tried it, or a small set of cities have tried it so far, is a land value tax. So we tend to have property taxes, um, which typically is not the same thing as a land tax. A land value tax encourages the owner to, uh, instead of just letting it sit idle, and utilizing the value of the land, which is very high, typically in cities, especially the bigger, more economically successful or larger uh, or superstar, brain hub type uh, cities. Um, so if you tax the value of the land instead of or in addition to property, you can potentially, uh, and again, we're just beginning to learn from actual experiments or actual experiences doing this, but you can potentially generate maybe even a quite significant quantity of of revenue. So partly it's doing better with what you already have, partly it may be trying new things. Uh, yeah, thank you for, the, for your speech. Uh, just one question, because you uh, said a lot about the contrast between urban, urban and non-urban areas, but I wonder, uh, I think cities are also linked to non-urban areas in the, in the sense of nutrition systems, agricultural systems, and I wonder whether your research also analyzes these relations, because of course you could imagine that a highly industrialized agricultural system is somehow linked to certain uh, structures of cities, to differences within cities, whether you have a more ecological, feasible uh, nutritional system, or whether you have a highly industrialized one, and I missed it a bit, because we can of course uh, counterpose and you, uh, the urban and non-urban areas, but the urban areas need the agricultural uh, space, basically, to produce wheat and to produce meat and whatever. Uh, and I missed that a bit on your talk. Do you have research on this? And could you? Uh... Yeah, we don't. We don't actually have much to say about this. We we. I mean, we don't have a strong view about uh, uh, how this should change, if at all, going forward. Of course, cities do need uh, non-urban areas mainly for food production. Uh, there's a possibility that will change a lot uh, as it becomes possible to produce more food in factories uh, which may or may not be located in urban areas or outside and we don't know how far this is going to go. Um, but it, it's very likely going to continue to be the case that cities will need rural areas just as rural areas need cities. Uh, and so trading, exchanging, respecting each other, helping each other where useful and convenient uh, we're fully in favor of, but we don't really have a strong opinion about anything that needs to change dramatically in this respect. The closest thing we want to say is that cities and also higher level governments, to the extent that they have 
been in the practice of or thinking of subsidizing uh, far-flung suburbs away from the cities, we want them to pay attention to this new research that shows that the infrastructure costs actually tend to be a lot higher than used to be thought, relative to the income tax revenues and, and other revenues that are generated from people living in these exurban areas or far-flung suburbs, as they're sometimes called. OK, there's another question over there. Hello. Um, if rich cities are being improved, but cities with high poverty not, how does this contribute to the real reduction of inequality as a whole? Yeah, so... The, the but, uh, excuse me, I just, um, I'm not meaning that um, more is better in the sense of um, if uh, good cities are, are being improved, that uh, a lot of people are, uh, are better, better off than other people. So that this, um, that this improves uh, equality. Um, I'm, just, I'm just thinking if rich cities are improving or being better, uh, that my concern is that we should start um, with the poverty, uh, with, with the poor cities and not with the rich cities first. So again, how does, how does, it, um, how is, how does it contribute um, to, to the real improvement of inequality if, if the rich cities are being improved instead of the, power, of the poor ones? Yeah, so the, the, the changes we recommend to the extent changes are needed, really we think apply to all cities. So trying to boost capabilities as the fundamental strategy for local government, local policymakers, we think applies everywhere. Uh, to cities that are already thriving, maybe are already very expensive, maybe have a lot of income inequality or maybe don't. Uh, and middle-sized cities, small cities, struggling cities, cities that formerly used to be very successful but have lost their, often it's the manufacturing base, so now they're doing not so well. All of these cities, we think, can probably do better by following these simple principles of boosting capabilities. Instead of trying to uh, attract in uh, lots of firms, essentially bribe firms to move in, it's not that that's the worst thing, and sometimes it does help, but on average it tends not to help. So what we're essentially trying to do, or hoping to do, is bring everyone up. And it may well be that superstar cities, you know, maybe Vienna here in Austria, are going to pull further away from the rest, uh, even if the rest are doing pretty well. That's a separate question. You know, if we have a lot more inequality between cities, is that bad? If so, is it worth doing something about? If so, what exactly will we do? I mean, we already do in practice things like this. So we tax at the national level. More revenue comes from the areas that are thriving. More gets given to areas that are not doing as well. So this is already a, a practice that's usually not talked about uh, a whole lot um, because nobody wants to get into a big fight about it. But most of us think, yeah, that's appropriate. That's probably fine. Um, but if we needed to do a lot, lot more, that, that there would be a political debate, and that, that's how we would try to resolve it. I should say that, for what it's worth, my co-author and I are pretty agnostic about how bad it is if particular cities are uh, well ahead of, of others. It's just not exactly clear what should be done to try to stop that from happening or to try to reverse it. You can redistribute a little bit, very much on board with doing that, but beyond that, not so sure. Um, I come from Copenhagen, uh, and in Copenhagen there is a perception uh, that a problem contributing to uh, increasing housing prices or lack of uh, housing for low-income uh, groups is the kind of purchase of properties by investment groups uh, and the use of different strategies to improve uh, or increase rents in these areas. Uh, we've also had like uh, great economic success from selling off public land to uh, private investors, uh, which has kind of led to the same development, is at least my perception. Uh, and I was wondering if you have some, some comments on this and in the absence of, absence of like a Vienna model where this is, we, we don't have like a lot of supply of public housing, is the Tokyo deregulation strategy then 
the only response, if according to you, uh, to such a situation? No, don't, we don't think it's the only response. Uh, so in talking about Tokyo and Vienna, uh, the only point there was to suggest that these seem to be the main responses here. Roughly speaking, try to reduce regulations as much as you can so the private market will help to uh, significantly increase the supply of housing or use the government, whether through uh, direct public ownership, public housing, or support heavy subsidization of, uh, of social housing, or other measures, maybe it's rent control, uh, maybe uh, in the United States the standard method we use now is to provide a voucher, it's a subsidy that pays part of the rent for people and then you just give them the choice and you hope the private market will respond with enough supply in order for it to work. So there are a variety of possibilities. I don't know enough about the case in Copenhagen to say, uh, other than the fact that uh, uh, private groups, this is becoming an issue, at least in the media reports, in, the, in certain cities in the United States as well. So um, uh, private equity groups buying up uh, large portions of the rental housing market in certain neighborhoods uh, and driving the price up in that way or simply keeping them off the market, which has the effect of drive or increasing the price. But so far, it's looking like this is a very small part of the picture, which doesn't mean that nothing should be done about it if we can figure out the right strategy. It just means that it's not really the fundamental thing, at least in the United States context, driving the problem of uh, rapidly rising rental prices in, uh, in cities. But again, I, I, I'm not sure about Copenhagen. And I certainly wasn't suggesting that Copenhagen should go the, the Tokyo route. I mean, it, you know, ultimately, these are political decisions. Um, but hopefully, evidence on the experience of various countries can inform those decisions, at least, along with fairness considerations and political power and leverage and ideology and the various other things that come into play in policymaking. Well, Lane, thank you very much for uh, answering the questions. Thank you also for the talk. Thank you for coming, listening, contributing to the discussion. And we have now prepared some glasses of drinks uh, in, in the back side of the room or on the other side of the doors. I would like to invite you to stay on for a while and uh, to continue the discussion in a more private framework. So. We would very much appreciate having you for a while. Thank you very much for coming, and I hear very close to session.